Good morning, everyone. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, I'm Karine Walther, one of the co-organizers of the conference and an associate professor here of history at Georgetown Qatar. And on, the be on behalf of the organizing committee, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for day two of our conference, Global Histories and Practices of Islamophobia. We were absolutely thrilled by yesterday's discussions and we're really grateful for all of you and your engagement. Um, and we're looking forward to another set of enriching dialogues and exchanges. Our sessions today cover a wide range of topics including Islamophobia and the media, Islamophobia, Qatar and the World Cup, and Islamophobia and the global war on terror. We will also be engaging in forums which will take place at our uh, Georgetown University campus at Education City. And those forums will cover, cover tackling Islamophobia on college campuses. So thank you again for being here today. And I'm going to turn it over to um, our first panel, Constructing the Narrative, Islamophobia and the Media, which will be chaired by Jamal Al Shayad of the Al Jazeera Media Network. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. alaikum. Good morning, everyone. Uh, always good uh, to be the first panel of the day, because there's no excuses for people to either want to get out for lunch or fall asleep or anything. So uh, hopefully this is going to be a very lively discussion, something that uh, will continue in, uh, as we heard yesterday's uh, very thought-provoking sessions. Um, so I'm going to do a quick intro to our panelists, um, and then we're going to give each one of them five to seven minutes for opening remarks. Uh, and then hopefully we're going to then hear some questions from you through the QR codes. Everyone's got a QR code on their uh, table, they can uh, scan it to submit any questions or comments, um, and then we'll take it from there. So uh, we've got from, uh, from my left, uh, Spencer Ackerman. He's a columnist for The Nation magazine. Uh, he was a 2014 Pulitzer Prize winner for public service journalism because of his role in the Edward Snowden release uh, that uh, uh, the leaks to The Guardian. In 2022, his book, uh, which was called The Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump, was named the best book uh, of the year by the New York Times critics, uh, the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, and PBC, PBS rather, News Hour. Uh, it also won the uh, 2022 American Book Award. Uh, Spencer's got a Wired series on Islamophobic Counterterrorism training at the FBI, which also won uh, uh, back all the way back in 2012, uh, online na national magazine award for reporting. To his left, we have Dr. Mohammed Al Masri, uh, who is a professor in media studies program at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. He received his PhD in mass communication from the University of Iowa, where he was the presidential fellow. Uh, Dr. Al Masri's research on Arab media, representation of Muslims, and the media and terrorism has appeared in reputable uh, uh, publications, including uh, Journalism Practice, Journalism Studies, International Communication Gazettes, and others. Um, he's also written for Al Jazeera English, The Middle East Eye, The New Arab, Muftah, and many, many other uh, outlets, uh, both international and uh, regional. Uh, to his left is Leila Laryan. She's a Washington, D.C.-based uh, journalism. She's the executive producer of Al Jazeera English's Fault Lines uh, program. She's produced documentaries on subjects ranging from Trump's administration's Muslim ban to uh, the uh, 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 investigations into factory conditions producing garments for Walmart in Bangladesh. She's won two Emmy Awards, uh, as well as the uh, a Polk Award and many others. Actually, I can't, if I'm going to start listing them, we'll be here for a good half an hour. Um, uh, Leila worked for Al Jazeera English's news department for four years, covering everything from Guantanamo Bay's youngest detainee to the resettlement of Iraqi refugees in the US. Uh, academically, she received her BA in English Literature from Georgetown, so an alumni of uh, of our hosts or organizers today, um, and then her MS from Columbia's uh, Graduate School for Journalism. Um, and she's got work that's appeared in other uh, outlets, not just Al Jazeera, so from the, Na uh, the Nation Salon, The Independent, and other publications. Um, and she also co-authored the book as well. Uh, and then last but not least, we have uh, Sana, and Sana is a senior uh, producer at Al Jazeera Plus, or a presenter as well, Sana Saeed. Uh, she's the host of Backspace, which is a media critique show that looks at how news stories are told, the roots of contemporary narrative, and considers what 
uh, a different approach to those stories could look like. So hopefully we'll be hearing about different approaches to countering Islamophobia here. Sana has been covering global anti-Muslim politics and news coverage for over a decade. And in 2014, she exposed a pro-Israel program created by the Shalom Hartman Institute to target Muslim or, or organizing on Palestine. She coined the term faith washing to explain how the Israeli occupation and apartheid of Palestine is often uh, dangerously reduced to a religious conflict in popular media narratives. Uh, she's Canadian uh, and has spent most of her life in the United States and also uh, resides in Washington. Um, so that's a very brief uh, intro to uh, our esteemed panelists. And uh, without further ado, I guess, uh, Spencer, if you want to kick us off. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to confine my remarks to American and British media because that's where I've worked. Um, we should think of media not just as a communication mechanism, but as a permission structure. And we know that because we saw it operate like that for the past 22 years, uh, giving permission for casually and structurally Islamophobic messages from respectable news outlets and distinguished reporters that perhaps weren't vulgar messages, but nonetheless carried the implication that 9-11 had a civilizational explanation and Islam, particularly in America, represented a collective threat to American national security. It's important to emphasize that oftentimes these narratives appeared in respectable, liberal news organizations, not fringe or avowedly right-wing media where open bigotry was acceptable. One aspect of how this worked, I think, is underappreciated. Uh, Muslim civil rights organizations, particularly the Council on American-Islamic Relations, were treated as thin edges of the wedge of terrorism. Sympathy for the Palestinians amongst board members was sufficient for news organizations to either fear platforming Muslim civil rights activists or to treat those perspectives as tantamount to anti-Semitism and terrorism. Uh, there are people here from CAGE. I couldn't quote them. They were very often treated as terrorist apologists by editors who would get nervous when you would uh, see them or uh, aspects of, of their messages and stories. Um, think, for instance, about um, frankly, deranged academics like Bernard Lewis, um, who would uh, put really just insane and incendiary things um, in his um, popular writing that would treat Islam as tantamount to pathology. Um, and he would publish that in The New Yorker. So the you know, most prestigious and respectable institutions in the United States after 9-11 and for years and years afterwards were very, very comfortable platforming that. Um, a case study occurred in 2010 with a media event that turned violent um, that's known forever as the Ground Zero Mosque. And I'm sure a number of you here rep uh, remember this episode, but it's far back enough in the past that just recounting it feels like you're entering an alternate reality. Um, in brief, two prominent Muslim New Yorkers, one of them an imam known for interfaith efforts, sought to renovate a property destroyed on 9-11 into an Islamic version of the 92nd Street Y, which is a civic space in Manhattan that's nominally religious but acts as a general cultural forum. Very deliberately stoked outrage on the right treated this as an act of civilizational affront. They called it the Ground Zero Mosque. It's neither at Ground Zero nor was the mosque the primary attribute of the planned space. And Rupert Murdoch's New York Post and Fox News devoted endless space in 2010 to calling it um, essentially an insult to the 9-11 dead. Mainstream outlets, and this is the important point, ignored or euphemized the substance of the objections to it, which at their heart were about restricting Islam's space for public visibility, and covered it like a circus, treating the outrage as an authentic expression of patriotism rather than a deliberately manufactured one. They saw its quick admixture with the nativist Tea Party movement, but hesitated to address the implications of that, let alone to connect the outrage to frustrations with the war on terror. And that's what I mean by structurally Islamophobic messages in mainstream presentation. Meanwhile, Imam Rauf, who had written a book called literally, What's Right with Islam is What's Right with America, had to constantly defend himself against being an apologist for terrorism. Most significantly, while a big Ground Zero mosque protest was happening in Manhattan, one of the agitated people stabbed a cab driver named Ahmed Sharif while talking about manning a checkpoint as if he were a soldier. This guy was a film student, not a veteran, and not a single news outlet referred to this as radicalization. They rarely reported on the law enforcement consultants, politicians, and media figures who spread a theory called civilization jihad that held Sharia law was coming to replace the Constitution and Muslim immigration was an invasion. It was what we now understand as the white genocide theory narrative in an earlier form. Um, and that brings me to perhaps my final point. 
A lot of people think Islamophobia has faded in relevance as hatreds against other American minorities have crested and proven politically advantageous. But it was a beta test for them and a demonstration effect in how much respectability would be granted to persecution of an internal minority backed by the terrifying force of the US national security state. The persecution would be justified in news outlets as a response to a legitimate security threat, and the media would very rarely challenge it beyond the margins. The function of that narrative is to ensure that the United States does not address how US destabilization, security, economic, and climatological created all number of problems. You can see this in coverage of immigration, where they don't talk about what created those refugees in the first place and how it continues to do so. Meanwhile, today, the media treats the war on terror as finished because President Biden withdrew from Afghanistan. Yet the authorizations, operations, and institutions of the war on terror remain mostly in place, especially with those with repressive applications domestically. There's a lawsuit right now challenging the no-fly list and other watch lists that are full of Muslim names. The Department of Homeland Security has never purged the data inside the NSEERS database of at least 80,000 Muslims, which means this functional Muslim database can be reactivated. I could go on, but Islamophobia is institutionalized in the US government and normalized in, in US media. Finally, there's going to be a war on terror memorial on the National Mall in Washington. Never before has a memorial been constructed to a US war while it's still being waged. What sort of messages will it send about who the enemy is and where the enemy still is? What role will the media class play in which messages are and aren't permissible in this monument? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Spencer. Uh, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm honored to be uh, taking part in this panel. I feel a little bit out of place because I'm the only uh, non-journalist. Um, I think I was invited on uh, because I maybe can speak from the perspective of a, a media researcher. So let me say a few things about uh, media research into uh, portrayals of Muslims and Islam. And I'll focus mostly um, on American, uh, American journalism, just because that's where my focus has been in, in my own research. Uh, but so it won't, it won't come as a shock to anyone that the research shows that Muslims and Islam are portrayed stereotypically and negatively, right? There are a ton of studies. In fact, there was just a meta-analysis done uh, recently. A, a meta-analysis is a study of studies and uh, they looked at more than 300 studies on, on, this one, uh, on this one issue. And the findings are pretty consistent. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting is that uh, the finding that Muslims are covered negatively and stereotypically holds over time, despite what some people have suggested that things have changed for the better over time. There really isn't much empirical evidence for that uh, notion. Um, another thing that's interesting is that the negative portrayals uh, seem to hold whether we're talking about American news coverage of foreign issues or domestic issues. And that's a significant finding because there have been some people who have suggested that the negative coverage only comes in the context of foreign news, right? Um, I think one of the more insidious and, and maybe tragic aspects of this whole thing is that you know, if you're an American news consumer, you almost never hear about Islam unless something bad is happening. Journalism tends to do mainstream American journalism, uh, not just with Muslims, by the way. There's a, a lot of research on uh, representations of uh, Latinos, representations of African Americans, and other groups. So, you know, what are the ramifications of never hearing about Muslims and Islam except in the context of bad news, something awful? happening, right? That's a question that we have to, that we have to ask ourselves. Um, and that brings me to some of, some of my own research. Uh, my my uh, co-author and I did some studies recently on coverage of terrorism. And, and we worked comparatively. So we wanted to look at, you know, this idea of, of sympathy. You know, one of the broad questions that we're asking ourselves is, are Americans given the opportunity to sympathize with Muslims? Are Muslims humanized? And, and so that's one of the things that we're, that we're looking at. And so we did uh, some comparative work looking at terrorist attacks that targeted Muslims on the one hand and non-Muslims on the other hand. 
And we were very strategic in terms of how we selected the, the attacks. And I don't have time to go through all of the data with you, but the long and the short of it is that when Muslims are the victims of terrorism, American news media tend to not be very interested, despite very high casualty figures in the events that we, that we selected. Also, those acts of terrorism are not framed, for the most part, as acts of terrorism. Other frames, like internal conflict frames, are employed, and that's something very interesting, despite the fact that the acts that we selected meet the textbook definitions of, of terrorism, right? Um, so you find very significant differences. On the other hand, when non-Muslims are the victims of terrorist attacks, the news media tend to be very interested uh, in, these, in these events, uh, and they frame them as acts, uh, acts of terrorism. Um, also, one of the things that we found is that the non-Muslim victims of terrorism are much more likely to be humanized and personalized in the, in the news reporting. And that's an, important, uh, that's an important finding. And that'll bring me to, and I'll just maybe close with a couple of points about news coverage of Israel-Palestine. And I do think that's, a, that's an important issue. And I don't think it's uh, irrelevant to the discussion at all. It's not just a political issue. I think it's also, uh, in part, a, an issue of Muslim identity. And historically, uh, Israel-Palestine has been fertile grounds for um, uh, Islamophobic uh, media discourse and Islamophobic uh, political discourse. So I think it's relevant. In, um, in one study that, that I did years ago, I looked specifically at uh, killings in uh, Israel-Palestine, right? So I was looking at instances where Palestinians killed Israelis and where uh, Israelis killed Palestinians. And I, I mapped them out over a two-year period. And what I find, I mean, again, there's a lot of data. This was a 90-plus page report. But um, in a nutshell, what I found is that the New York Times and Chicago Tribune are not terribly interested in news about Palestinian death, number one. They're very interested in news about Israeli death when a Palestinian kills, when a Palestinian kills an Israeli. Also, and this was maybe the more important finding, when Israel kills a Palestinian, there is a consistent self-defense frame employed by the newspapers. This is very consistent um, in, 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 in the study that I did and also in some other uh, you know, work of other scholars. When Palestinians kill Israelis, um, a, a, terrorism frame, a terrorism frame is employed um, and the acts are condemned. And I found the same thing that I talked about earlier in the context of the other, other study uh, um, in regards to humanization. Israeli victims are humanized and personalized. Palestinian victims are not. And the last thing that I'll say, because I want to tie this back into what uh, was spoken about yesterday uh, with regards to uh, Muslim Islamophobia, which is also something that I'm interested in. I've, I've, I've done some work on Egypt in that regard, because I think there's a lot of Islamophobic discourse out of, uh, out of Egypt, both uh, by the Sisi regime and its, uh, its media apparatus. Um, but we just finished a study that we published in the International Journal of Communication about Emirati newspaper coverage of Palestinians. And what we did is we looked at uh, Al Bayan, which is a daily newspaper in uh, the Emirates, we looked at Al Bayan coverage of the Palestinians before and after the, uh, the signing of the normalization agreement in 2020. And we hypothesized that there would be pretty significant differences, but we never could have imagined how dramatic those differences uh, were. I wish I had time to go through all of the data uh, with you. I think it's quite interesting. But briefly, uh, before, uh, before the normalization agreement was signed, there was actually quite a lot of sympathy for the Palestinians. There was a, a significant discussion of Israeli oppression, Israeli aggression, Israeli violence, and the occupation was mentioned on average 3.02 times per article. That's a, that's a significant number. After 
uh, the normalization agreement was signed, there was a 180 degree change. First of all, Palestinian sources disappeared. They were replaced by Israeli sources. The framing changed. There was no longer uh, discussion of Israeli aggression, oppression, and violence. And the word occupation completely disappeared. It was used exactly zero times in the two months of coverage that we followed after the, uh, after the normalization agreement. You know, if there's time, you know, maybe in the Q&A we can talk about, and I'd really be interested in hearing the, the professional journalist perspectives about why this, why this happens. You know, why does news get produced about Muslims uh, in this way? But I'll leave, my, I'll, I'll leave my remarks at that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed Leila. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here, and thank you for Georgetown University in Qatar for inviting me to join so many incredible speakers who came from around the world. I'm also honored to share the stage with my fellow co-panelists and colleagues whose work I deeply admire and respect. So the language that journalists use, uh, choose to use, how we frame a story, what we choose to cover or not cover, shapes the way the audiences see a story, and more profoundly, how all of us see the world. What is it about the coverage of Islam and Muslims that often seems to bring out the worst in journalists, that makes them drop their standards of professionalism, independence, scrutiny, and the duty to challenge power structures? Why is it the, that the most sensationalistic coverage of Muslims is often what gets attention, accolades, and awards? August 13th, 2015, New York Times headline, ISIS enshrines a theology of rape by Rukmini Kalamaki. Just a warning that this passage contains references to sexual violence. Quote, and this is the beginning of the article, in the moments before he raped the 12-year-old girl, the Islamic State fighter took the time to explain that we, what he was about to do was not a sin. Because the preteen girl practiced a religion other than Islam, the Quran not only gave him the right to rape her, it condoned and encouraged it, he insisted. He bound her hands and gagged her. Then he knelt beside the bed and prostrated himself in prayer. When it was over, he knelt to pray again, bookending the rape with acts of religious devotion. In other words, that's the end of the passage, he prayed, raped the girl, and then prayed again. What this article was trying to do is make a clear connection between the act of prayer, which Muslims do every day, 1.7 billion of them, to one of the most horrific acts you can commit against someone else. The author of this article was asked, if this ISIS fighter is so religious, and if he's a practicing Muslim, wouldn't he have showered in between the acts? And the author responded, yes, he did. That's what the Yazidi girls told me, but it was too much explanation to include for a Western audience. The truth is, it would have undermined what she was trying to do, which is connecting the prayer with rape. It would have stood in the way of a good narrative structure. As journalists, we know that what we leave out is, important, is as important as what we include. Rape has been used as a weapon of war in nearly every conflict and war in our time, from Serbian troops raping Bosnian Muslim women to women more recently and girls in Tigray, Ethiopia, subjected to rape and sexual violence by multiple militia groups and uh, troops. It's generally reported factually in the context of a human right violation that must be investigated and sp its perpetrators held accountable. In this case, this piece, I'm sure many of you remember it, provoked a crisis within the West, and frankly for Muslims who ask themselves, does our religion actually prescribe this? It was no longer a horrifying feature of every war or conflict. It was now practically a religious obligation, despite the fact that this group represents itself and was created as a result of the 2003 US invasion and occupation of Iraq, a detail too inconvenient to include in much of the reporting about it. The brutality of ISIS speaks for itself. It did not need exaggeration or a narrative that yoked it strictly to religion when it grew out of very real geopolitical conditions. To say nothing of the fact that the vast majority of its victims were fellow Muslims who did not agree with their extremist ideology. A year earlier in 2014, CNN held a debate innocently headlined, are Muslims being portrayed unfairly? But on the screen, a large banner read VIOLENCE IN THE NAME OF ALLAH IN ALL CAPS. The very serious anchors and their guests then went on to debate whether Islam somehow lends itself to more extremism than other religions, and whether or not moderate Muslims do enough to speak about it. I think we've all heard that debate before. As if this topic would be debated in the context of any other religion and not be considered bigoted. 
One of the guests, Mark Lamont Hill, whom you may have heard is no longer employed by CNN uh, due to his support for Palestinians, said, I'd like to think we would assume that the average Muslim, just like the average Christian or anyone else, begins from a place of basic human decency. You shouldn't have to denounce beheadings. We should assume you don't believe in them. And when he mentioned that people have committed violence in the name of other religions, he was shouted down by another guest, Ben Ferguson, who said, quote, there are a lot of people in the world that believe in the extremism of Islam, whatever that means. It didn't matter that Mark had actually read the Quran and was defining Arabic terms like jihad for viewers, or another point uh, that another guest, Lisa Bloom, made that this is about extremism, not a particular religion. These two sides were presented as being equally viable. The truth is it's much easier to paint Islam as an inherently violent religion that's op oppressive to women because these are old ideas that confirm the audience's worst biases. And what journalists leave out in their reporting exposes their blind spots. Given the instability, chaos, violence, and power vacuum that came with the US occupation of Iraq and overall destabilization of the region, is it any wonder that a group like ISIS would emerge? But a feature of reporting at this time was that it left out the context in which these groups rose in favor of sensationalist reporting that centered Islam to the exclusion of the proximate cause, which is the US war in Iraq. This is not controversial and a point that even US military and intelligence officials have made. If you scale the number of Iraqis killed in the US war in occupation to the US, there would be between one and eight million dead Americans. There's no way the conversation about what happened to the US would be centered around the question of what's wrong with their culture, what's wrong with their religion. These examples are a drop in the bucket of clips, newspaper articles, internet videos, and social media posts that have painted Islam in this light. Only 38% of Americans say they know a Muslim, so many obviously rely on the media to shape their narratives and their opinions of Islam and Muslims. We're all consumers of media. I don't have to tell you the general feeling we all have when we come across coverage like this. But the truth is these feelings we have are backed up by data. Numerous studies by political scientists confirm that media coverage of Muslims, as Dr. Masri told us, is overwhelmingly negative, especially compared to that of other religious groups. Just to give you one example, there's many, many studies. Dr. Masri himself has, has um, worked on some of them. But there's a, a political scientist named Rochelle Terman who conducted a study that concluded that US media outlets portray Muslim societies as distinctly sexist and misogynist, even compared to similar non-Muslim societies with poor women's rights records. She looked at articles in the New York Times and Washington Post from 1980 to 2014, which is a period of 35 years, uh, looked at 4,000 articles and found that, um, surprise, surprise, they're based on negative stereotypes and usually centered on one issue, which is gender inequality, when you're reporting on Muslim women. Um, even Muslim women who live in relatively equal societies are covered in these terms. Women outside the Muslim world, meanwhile, are portrayed with greater complexity, and those pieces tend to focus on issues like work-life balance, electoral politics, arts, business. And what's the impact of all this? Uh, such disproportionate coverage feeds negative stereotypes about Islam, which affects public attitudes and helps shape policy, which has very real effects on people's lives. And of course, the other prong of coverage on, uh, about Islam is violence. According to a study by the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, or ISPU, Muslims who plot violence get seven times more media coverage than uh, violence uh, by other groups and four times longer sentences. And let's take a minute to unpack these plots. We know the overwhelming majority of so-called terrorist plots that have been uncovered by the FBI since 9-11 were in fact manufactured, orchestrated by the FBI itself, usually through confidential informants sent into the communities, people with criminal records. Even so, media coverage of these plots have often amounted to stenography, um, a lack of scrutiny, and you have journalists simply repeating the government's allegations rather than reporting them out to see if there's any truth in them. This is something we see time and again, a lack of rigor, professionalism, and independence when it comes to covering the Arab Muslim world that has very real and dangerous consequences. Look no further than the mainstream media's coverage that preceded the Iraq war when they published lies and false claims and eventually ended up having to issue half-hearted apologies to their readers. <clears throat> 
Unfortunately, this deference to authority and lack of scrutiny and skepticism when it comes to claims by the state defines the tone of most reporting on Islam and Muslims and terrorism, a term that seems to exist only in reference to Muslim violence, both real and, and feared. Islamophobia is both systemic and institutionalized, as Spencer told us, and could not exist without a media that falls in line with government policy or at the very least refrains from questioning it. Because questioning it then calls into question who we are in relation to the civilizational battle being fought. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leila. Sana, go ahead. All right, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, okay, so I can feel like the energy, you know, it's 9 a.m., everyone's exhausted. Me too, I don't do coffee right before I speak, so I'm ready to sleep. But okay, can we get, is everyone, you know, let's wake up a little bit, let's engage. I know that Islamophobia is an exciting topic to talk about first thing in the morning. Um, so hopefully, um, so I'm actually really glad that I very strategically sat at the end because um, everyone here talked about what right, uh, Islamophobia in the U.S. news media in particular, which I'm also really glad uh, was focused here, and I'll explain why that's really important for our context, um, because that is what I focus on as well. But I'm actually going to ask the question of why this happens, right? Um, so um, as a journalist who is primarily interested in media literacy, that's what I do for a living, I'm, you know, I look at how are we telling the stories that we're all consuming on a day-to-day -day basis. What's being said in between the lines? What's being said even in our headlines, right? Whether we're reading or we're watching, what is it that we're being told? What, are, what is the root of, um, of these stories, the historical roots, the material roots, economic, political, so on and so forth? Um, and I actually think a very unhealthy, a very unhealthy amount about the ways that Muslims and Islam um, are, are not just portrayed, but discussed and understood within the news media, and also by you know, Muslims themselves. What is the language that we're using about ourselves? And you know, uh, touching on a theme that's been um, regarding uh, you know, Muslim Islamophobia itself. Um, and so I, like many others, and what I'm about to say is that you know, it's not anything novel, but I actually don't like the term Islamophobia itself, right? Again, I'm thinking about what is the language that we're using? What is that language telling us? What function is that language playing? Um, and in my opinion, it's a very poor term because it doesn't actually accurately describe what it is that we are discussing when we talk about Islamophobia. Um, because when I say Islamophobia, right, what is the first thing that pops into your head, right? We're thinking about maybe hijab and abaya bands. We're maybe thinking about the entirety of the existence of France, right? <laughs> where, where the mm, controversial opinion? I don't think so, not in this room. Um, you know, where we're thinking about maybe, you know, uh, uh, like Ground Zero Mosque, as, as Spencer mentioned. Um, we're, you know, at maybe a higher level, we're thinking about the daily dehumanization of Palestinians, which I'm really glad that um, Dr. Al Nasri mentioned because that is absolutely the dehumanization of Palestinians is part and parcel of the way that uh, Islam, like what Islamophobia uh, as it exists today and how it functions. Um, and yesterday was mentioned a few times uh, that uh, throughout some of the panels that Islamophobia is also about power. Um, and the thing is, academics love nothing more than talking about power, right? You know what I'm talking about? Everything's power. Because that's the thing. Everything is power, right? Me, even sitting up here, we have a bit of a power imbalance, right? Because what is power? It's essentially, uh, I wrote it down. I'm like, how did I want to describe this? Uh, it's basically the stratification of an imbalance of permission, as also was mentioned by, by Spencer. Permission for one person or individual to do something to someone else and the arbitrary or created circumstances that allow that imbalance uh, to happen. And, um, uh, but power is, I don't think that actually tells us what Islamophobia is about. I think we need to start thinking about Islamophobia. And I'm going to use the term, even though I said I don't like it, I always like to mention that I don't like the term, but just for brevity um, and because I didn't come up with anything else, but I'm working on it. Um, but, you know, I think we have to start thinking about um, what function is Islamophobia serving. And I think we need to start thinking about that all bigotries that we know about, that we experience, that we see, serve a function, right? I, I, you know, it's easy to think about, for instance, um, when we look at anti-black racism in the United States, which is where I live, 
um, it played and continues to play a function, right? It's not just simply a slur that someone throws out. It's not simply um, police brutality in and of itself, right? When we look at what anti-black racism is, it is, the function of it is to allocate resources from one group to another, including using that one group as the resources that are being allocated to the other group, right? When we look at, this might be a little controversial in this room, but we, when we look at the stratification of even economic labor across the Gulf, right? It's across, again, ethnic lines, it is serving a function. And what is that function, once again? About the allocations of, uh, the allocation of resources for one particular group at the expense and exploitation of another group, right? And so when we also look at ethno-nationalist ideology, such as Zionism, what is the function of Zionism, right? It's, again, the allocation of resources for one group at the very violent expense to the point of destruction of another entire population and history. And so we have to look at bigotries as part and parcel of how we interact with one another um, at the state and labor levels. The nation state system that we live in right now causes these type of bigotries to be systemic, right? So I'm not saying that, you know, bigotry like is, is new, that this has just happened when, when we came about with, with the nation state, right? I mean, issues of xenophobia big, uh, existed for, you know, thousands and thousands of years. Um, but it's more about what happens when we take the idea of taking from people and we, we take that and we put it into the state structure itself, which is a, which is a very you know, bureaucratic, strong institution that's also tied to how we identify as individuals and collectively. And so then we need to ask, you know, um, uh, what is the function of this thing that we're talking about, Islamophobia? And as a journalist who's worked in the United States for over a decade, almost a decade at this point, at this point, I've been writing about anti-Muslim politics in the news media for over 15 years. Um, you know, the I think the answer to that question is also looking at what function does U.S. news media itself play, which is, and I'm going to say this, and I say this as a journalist, which I know a lot of journalists don't like what I'm about to say, but it's propaganda. And that's not unique to US news media, right? I think media in general is propaganda. It could be good propaganda, it could be bad propaganda. But it's ultimately, I think, when you're dealing with the flow of information, when you're dealing with taking information and sending it to the masses, there's, it's going to essentially function more or less as propaganda. And so there's nothing unique about that in terms of US news media. But, and I'm really glad that we've all focused on US news media because it is not only the most powerful empire in human history as we know it, although I know the Mongolians may, may disagree. They're like, please, you're still recovering. Um, but, but um, you know, it, it's also the greatest purveyor of violence, right? The United States is the greatest purveyor of violence. And if you don't believe me, listen, uh, Martin Luther King said that years ago too, so it's not just me. Um, but, and not just internationally, but also at the domestic level. Right? And so we have to look at what function is US news media playing in the context of American violence, American imperial violence in particular. Um, and, and, and especially when this media has the power to, tr like, to me, the Islamophobia that we see in our news media is a trickle down, right? It's not the pusher of Islamophobia, it takes from the grandiose, like the superstructure that exists of, of the American state and the imperial power and actually is pushing that out, right? So it's a trickle down. And then that continues to trickle down into that kind of day-to-day -day mundane, so to speak, Islamophobia that we talk more about. Um, and so again, uh, and of course the power is that what the media is doing is that it ultimately serves to also justify certain policies and ideas about Muslims, which have already been discussed, whether it's war on terror, whether it's like, you know, protesting a, a community center because it's like a few blocks away from the, the, the site of the September 11th attacks. Um, so again, what is the function of Islamophobia? And I think that the answer is actually a lot easier to determine than not. And we can, we can talk about this in the Q&A. Um, but we can start by looking at US foreign policy. Many, if not most, US Muslims will look at uh, Islamophobia as much more localized, right? Um, pe again, people stopping the building of mosques, people protesting Eid prayers, politicians usually, you know, casually talking about eviscerating entire Muslim nations. Um, again, 
you know, hijab bans, so on and so forth. Um, but again, we have to look at it as a trickle-down system of bigotry that positions Islam and Muslims as inherent threats, as always suspect, that we are presented as either peaceful or nonviolent. We're given this choice that we cannot exist as just people, that there is always this constant choice. And I always think about in the, um, after, in the aftermath, in the immediate aftermath of the Christchurch shooting, right, the, the Christchurch massacre, which killed over 50 Muslim worshipers in New Zealand, the way that it was being framed immediately was, you know, 50 peaceful worshipers killed. It's like, why, why are we calling worshipers peaceful? Because what's the implication there, right? It's like Layla said, what we, include, what we don't include is as important as what we, what we include as well, right? So if we're saying that they're peaceful, what are we saying about other Muslims possibly? The idea is that there's always the threat still there. If they're not peaceful, there may be something else, which is violent, right? So it's this kind of false choice which is given, given to Muslims. Um, and so that positioning of Muslims in U.S. foreign policy is, again, part and parcel of how U.S. foreign policy itself requires constant threats that exist simultaneously. And the construction of threats in foreign policy requires the construction of threats in the minds of the people that the United States governs, right? Or any country governs, right? Um, uh, and so when we look at how, for instance, Russia and Russians are depicted and have been for decades, uh, especially since the Cold War, when we look at how Chinese and how the Chinese and China have been depicted in U.S. news and popular media for over 100 years, I have an episode on this, um, you know, we can begin to understand clearly what role the U.S. news media is playing, um, uh, and then we can begin tackling the question of what function Islamophobia is playing. Because the key difference, of course, is that, you know, I, I use these two examples, China and, and, and Russia, those are countries, right? And this is what makes Islamophobia, especially when it's being dispersed through, through the media and the U.S. news media, um, so much more nefarious. There are no borders to Islam, right? Regardless of what Saudi thinks. There are no borders to Islam, right? There, there's no, Muslims don't exist simply in one simple place. Anyone can turn Muslim when they want to, right? Um, and so that's what makes it so much more nefarious when, that, when Islam and Muslims are constructed as threats. And so I think, again, that the answer of what the function of anti-Muslim politics is actually something that um, was, was referred to yesterday, which is that it is about, you know, so-called governing of the ungovernable, right? It's about pushing uh, against an envisioning of political life, economic life that is antithetical to an American project and, of course, a European project that requires the remaking of the world in its own image but still subservient. Right? And I want to also discuss like, the political economy of news coverage of Islam and Muslims and others, because there's a lot of money there. But I'm going to save the good stuff for the Q&A. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sana. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for your uh, opening remarks. And uh, we have several questions coming in. But uh, I want to start off with, with a question that uh, Dr. Masri posed at the end there, um, which was, you know, questioning, you know, he wondering how and why journalists come up with specific wordings and terminology. And I know everybody touched upon it in terms of examples that are being used. Um, but the question still remains, how is it allowed to happen and why does it happen? Because often it happens too often for it to be coincidental, right, when these things happen. And I, I'm just going to attach that part of the question with uh, some of the stuff that uh, Sana was touching upon there as well, which is the use of the term Islamophobia, and maybe I'm going to add on to it something else because I was thinking about it yesterday when we were listening to the opening uh, address by uh, Ambassador uh, Rasul. Uh, there is a difference between your average person who can be scared of something out of ignorance or not knowing, right? And then there is a difference between the person who actually peddles that fear and incites for it, right? So I would say there is uh, as just a, as, a, as a hypothesis for you guys to discuss here, it is very legitimate for people to be scared of what they don't know, but as Ambassador Rasul said yesterday, it's not legitimate for somebody to act upon that, in a specific, that ignorance in a certain way and definitely not to encourage that ignorance. So is there a higher layer of what, we would, or what I would describe as anti-Muslim hatred that then uses Islamophobia right, to, uh, to peddle it through 
specifically orchestrated and curated narratives. And I'm going to give, you know, so, uh, Leila gave that example. I'll tell you one specific example as a journalist I remember with ISIS. There was a report that somebody um, had, uh, was, had written that I was expected to read. And it was about when ISIS fighters took over a certain piece of Syria. Uh, and uh, it started off saying the ISIS flag waves or something, the ice, or, or in the wind or something, right? Now, obviously, the, the, the flag they were talking about had the seal of the Prophet, right? It wasn't uh, the ISIS flag as so much as the US flag is not the KKK flag, right? And I had a discussion with the editor at the time. I said, I'm not going to call it the ISIS flag. You can say ISIS fighters celebrate taking control. You can say ISIS fighters have, re have captured the whatever, but I won't say the ISIS. And, it, and, and obviously, it was an Muslim editor who didn't understand the significance of the seal and what it means and everything else and and I tried to give that example but there was this just straight up lock no you are somehow kind of biased towards ISIS because you refuse to call it the ISIS flag now in that specific moment this is where I want to hear you know you're, you start questioning is this person actually actively trying to push this anti-Muslim narrative or are they have they been so socially conditioned because they are veteran journalists who've been hearing this other narrative throughout the past 20, 30, 40 years pouring down that they are so programmed, they cannot comprehend it. Khalas, it's, you're so dehumanized that it doesn't matter what you say. You know? Now, where, and maybe Spencer, you can start and we'll, we'll take it, or actually we'll maybe reverse and we'll take it around the, the other way, although you did have more time than everybody else. But we'll start with, with Sana. May, you know, where, where, where does that happen? The why and who is pushing these agendas? And is there really somebody pushing the agendas? I mean, you guys touched upon it a bit when you're talking about Murdoch and others. I mean, I don't think it's coincidental when you have these massive kind of conglomerates of media outlets and they all push a specific line. But where does the line start and where does it stop? And that person who's written that article or used that term, are they actually aware of it? And where does the responsibility lie? Can we start? Go on. Okay, well, thank you for letting me speak again. Um, so I think a lot of it is, uh, I, I, Layla's talked about this a bit, and so I, I'm gonna talk about it just briefly, and I think she can talk about it a bit more, and I'll Spencer as well. Um, but I think there's a lot of, so yes, a lot of it is conditioning, right? Like, if we look at, uh, there, there's so many historians, I'm sure, in the audience, like if you look at even old texts from, from the eras of, all, you know, all the Crusades, when you see, like, the English, you know, or the Europeans uh, encountering, uh, you know, various Arab populations, if you look at the way they talk about them, right? I mean, it's kind of the kind of similar, like, oh, these weirdos, like, what is this? Um, what do they believe? That's so bizarre. Um, it's not necessarily as hate, it becomes over time, yes, but it's not that same kind of, they don't have like necessarily a shared language, like throughout the literature of these people are like this, so on and so forth. Um, and so something like this, uh, I think is very, it's very new and it's very, um, uh, it's very much so also connected to like, it's security language. Right, it's securitization language. It's, it's, it's language that we find in national security projects. It's also a language that we find that's being pushed from, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 what's it called? Um, especially, I think in like the in the 70s and 80s, you had like a, a lot of Israeli language that was being used to describe Palestinians. Um, and so this type of language ends up seeping into unfortunately, journalism. And it's not just, you know, unique to Islam and Muslims and how they're discussed, but for instance, when we look at how police and, and crime are, are, are covered in the United States, the language that we use in our industry is coming directly from police unions, right? Because those relationships, because the, the, it, uh, a media is an institution, and any institution is gonna respect another institution because there's a mutually beneficial relationship there. And so whatever language is being used by the institutions of power, whether it's the police institution or the foreign policy institution or security institution and so on and so forth, that is the language that's gonna come in. And so when that is, and especially like there's a lot of reverence for these institutions and I think American journalists in particular, um, and again, that's the context that most of us are speaking in, uh, have this real special, like this idea of still that there is a good intention even when things go bad, there's still a good intention in what our government does. And so there's never really a questioning of what are these words and this language because we trust our security apparatus at its core even if we still can critique it. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think there's definitely a certain group think that happens in newsrooms. 
and if people try to sort of defy that, they're you know, accused of professional jealousy or, or silenced. Um, and I think one really instructive example, I don't mean to pick on, on the New York Times' ISIS coverage, but um, the, the New York Times is obviously an extremely powerful and influential news organization that really sets the tone and a lot of stories and a lot of news organizations follow suit, but there's a podcast called Caliphate, maybe some of you heard about it. Caliphate actually, the name itself I think is deeply problematic and Islamophobic. This was not a Caliphate ISIS recognized by the vast majority of Muslims in the world, but this podcast um, had 30 million downloads and it was extremely popular and it turned out to all have been based on a hoax. Um, the main character called himself Abu Huzaifa, said he was a ter an ISIS member who returned to Canada. Um, but the reason I bring up this podcast is because it promised to tell us like who ISIS really is and what do they stand for. And then sometimes it's the interviews that journalists give to answer your question, Jamal, of like, is this anti-Muslim hatred? What is it? That can be really instructive. So when the makers of this podcast that turned out to be a hoax were asked, what was your intention? They, one of them said in, in a Reddit, ask me anything, um, they said, well, Muslims deny that ISIS, that religion has anything to do with ISIS. And we set out to kind of prove that wrong. Like they really wanted to make sure that that connection was clearly made and sort of at the expense of and, and by exonerating US military actions. So that was really revealing and I think the reason I bring it up as sort of like, what it, what's the institutional backing for this kind of uh, reporting? The New York Times' media columnist, Ben Smith, actually wanted to do sort of an investigation to what went wrong, how did this hoax end up becoming this award-winning podcast, and he found that it was newsroom leaders who supported this kind of reporting, and I think this reductionist, sensationalist kind of reporting is what wins awards, as I mentioned. It's what uh, is attractive, it's what makes, um, the narrative that everybody wants to listen to that's exciting, that gives us a really clear enemy. And it's the shades of gray, the nuance, the like people who push back, who actually know, have expertise in the region, who know the language, who can understand the culture, um, who end up sort of being cast aside for the narrative that kind of confirms our fears, our um, pre-existing beliefs and biases. Okay. So, um I get asked this question uh, a lot, as, especially by like my Muslim friends, you know, uh, over dinner or at the mosque or whatever, and they want to hear from me because you know I do work in, in the media. But sometimes I think they don't really want to hear from me as much as they want to tell me what what's happening. And frequently, their version um, is that there's sort of like a conspiracy. You know, everybody hates Muslims, everybody hates Islam, and they sit around at the production meeting at the New York Times at 9 o'clock in the morning and they think about ways to cook up stories that make Muslims look bad, right? And that's very exciting and sexy and it would make a good movie, but I don't think that that's what's happening for the most part. Certainly there are some journalists that probably, you know, do that, but um, I don't think that's what's uh, happening for the most part. So, and I don't want to get too pedantic, but uh, the scholars talk about, journalism scholars talk about the sociology of news, how news is manufactured, how it's produced, how there are uh, constraints that exert themselves on news organizations and on journalists. And unfortunately, we do not have sociology of news work, research, on this particular issue. We don't have that. Uh, the, the, the work that has been done on Islamophobia or representations of Muslims and Islam and Arabs is basically content work. So that's a gap in the literature. But we can, you know, sort of surmise that what's happening is that all of these constraints are acting to push out a certain kind of uh, content, right? So what are these constraints? Um, one constraint has already been discussed, and that is sourcing. So uh, American journalism, Western journalism, Arab journalism uh, tends to rely on elite official sources. So at the end of the day, we're getting whatever, you know, the State Department said or whatever the police department said, right? So that's a big, big reason. Uh, that's one big uh, constraint. Another constraint, uh, Senna talked about uh, ideology and the superstructure, right? So part of American ideology uh, and Western ide ideology is we're good, right? The city upon a hill, 
we are righteous. We don't do evil. If we do, it's exceptional. It's aberrational. We don't, we don't do it as a normal practice. Uh, but we have enemies, and they do evil, right? And uh, Islam is foreign. That's part of the American ideological system, okay? So that's a big part of it. Uh, editorial policy it does play a significant uh, role. And Layla spoke about sensationalism. So they, news is a profit-making enterprise. They have to get clicks, they have to get readership, they have to get viewership, and part of what sells is that which is sensational, That's that which is negative. You know, I talked about the negativity associated with uh, reportage on Islam and Muslims, but there's a negativity bias, what they call conflict bias, in news reporting in general, in particular in Western uh, news reporting. So that's, uh, that's something else. And the last constraint that I'll mention, there are many others, but the last constraint that, that I think uh, helps to push out this kind of content is the individual level constraint, the, the, at the level of the individual journalist. One of the problems, and I'm, I'm very sympathetic to journalists, all of my colleagues here and, and everyone else, it's a very hard job, and, and you have deadlines and uh, word limits and you know, uh, editorial policy constraints and all of these things. Uh, but journalists are sort of jacks of all trades. They know a bit. Uh, about a lot of things, but they're not necessarily specialists. And so when I've done interviews, you know, I find that the journalist on the, on the other side of the microphone uh, doesn't necessarily know uh, a, a lot. And isn't... <laughs> that sounded very condescending. I didn't mean for it to sound that way. But they're, they're not experts. They're not uh, scholars of Middle East studies or you know, scholars of uh, Islam or, or, or something like that. So they're not necessarily even equipped to answer the right, uh, I'm sorry, to ask the right questions sometimes. And this is why we watch these interviews, and I saw that interview with Mark Lamont Hill and Ben Ferguson on uh, CNN years ago, and the questions even that are being posed are kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're sometimes absurd questions. And so that's part of, that's part of what's playing into this. I, I co-sign all of that. I'm extremely not offended by you saying that journalists... Um, I wasn't talking about you. Well, you, you you're could. The, you're the exception. You could, you could. But um, from a, I, I actually don't want to talk about this from a working journalist perspective, but given that Dr. Mosby raised the point, you know, a, a glib way to talk about this but isn't necessarily an incorrect way of talking about this is you don't have to know what you're talking about. You have to know just enough of what you're talking about to get to the 4 p.m. news meeting where you know what you're going to be presenting um, for publication uh, to your editors. Um, it's a not great way of working and it's, it's a reality of a constraint. I think it's more, nevertheless, um, instructive to look at the superstructures of this. Um, Sana mentioned at the end of her remarks the political economy of journalism. I'm going to be a vulgar Marxist for a moment. Um, when we talk about not just um, the specific question that Jamal posed, but um, the sort of general question um, of Islamophobia in media, I think we have to look at it from, you know, as we talk about it from an American perspective, a justification of U.S. resource extraction, because that's primarily what the United States is engaged in, um, in the Muslim world, security clientism, and a, present, and a preservation of American primacy. Um, On to the question of, uh, and everything is sort of downstream of that um, in a variety of ways. Hate is downstream of that and doesn't have to be a necessary component of it. Um, it can develop that way, uh, particularly in a vulgar sense, um, but it's, it, it, it's, I think, looking at it, you know, Islamophobia in terms of uh, hatred misses the point. Um, structurally, you know, extraction and primacy and exploitation is the point. The justification of those things um, is the point. Um, very often in newsrooms, um, an epithet uh, that we tend to throw around at each other if you kind of stray a bit outside of, you know, accepted modes of discourse is called being an activist which is supposed to stand in distinction to being a reporter, which takes, a, as some people call it, a, a view from nowhere, uh, a consideration of yourself as a reporter of, of, of being valueless. Uh, that, you know, not, I shouldn't say valueless as a, um, as a proposition as an individual, but in terms of not possessing values that your journalism reflects. Um, I think that is, um, frankly, a lie. Uh, it's, it's a way of misleading 
um, our readers and our viewers. I think um, the fetishization of objectivity uh, is a cover for the presentation of dominant narratives, which have to do with, as we've been saying, the justification of US resource extraction, security clientism, and primacy. Um, and I guess just to, to finish this up, um, from the perspective of institutions, I spent about a year and a half um, working, when I worked for Wired Magazine, um, working out of the Pentagon as Wired's uh, security correspondent there. The, the way you get from uh, the press bullpen in the Pentagon to the briefing room runs through a very, very large uh, corridor um, that is uh, the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs um, kind of stable of press officers who are often very immediately helpful to you. And working alongside these people who you are you know, formally charged with covering creates necessarily by design, not necessarily uh, a choice consciously made by a reporter of sympathy, of identification, and of building up a routine for how to get to that 4 p.m. meeting delivering what you know, your job is, which is delivering for what your editor needs. Um, in other contexts, particularly regulatory ones, we call this capture. And that, I submit, is a lot of what American journalism does and performs. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to take one of these questions and come back later to uh, Mohammed, your comments about um, unintelligent journalists. Um, <laughs> But um, I've got a question here from Asim Qureshi. Uh, and maybe Leila, you can, you can answer this, please. Asim is asking, how do you avoid reproducing prejudices against Muslims by using the Muslims are like others narrative while engaging with the media? And I think maybe here is the balance, if I, if I understood the question right here, you know, is there's this, on the one hand, the othering and dehumanizing of Muslims, and, on the other, uh, and then on, 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 on the other hand, there are those who are trying to say, well, you know, we're just like everybody else and so forth, which actually is also just as bad because it uh, strips Muslims of their individuality as well. It's almost as dehumanizing, obviously not, in, not with, it, with a good intention. So how do you avoid maybe, if I understood that question right, how do you avoid uh, 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 essentially the negative consequences of that uh, when you're engaging with the media? Yeah, it's a good question. I should also mention Awesome uh, edited a book called I Refuse to Condemn which I think is a really interesting and essential resource on this question that Muslims have faced since 9-11 of like, are we culpable for the actions of you know, a tiny number of people who declare themselves Muslim? And it's sort of a frame that I think Muslims have often been uh, covered through, which is, you know, I'm the exception, I'm the good Muslim uh, compared to the bad Muslim. And I think there needs to just be new standards and new best practices. You see, you know, with Sana mentioned the coverage of police shootings and um, the Associated Press a few years ago came out with sort of new best practices of like, don't use euphemistic language, don't say police involved shootings, call it what it is. And I think similarly with the coverage of Islam and Muslims, there needs to be a new set of best practices that ideally come from within journalists themselves who want to do better and start to demand better. And I think, you know, we shouldn't fall into this trap of, you know, these are the voices that we need to elevate. Um, you know, there's been a bigger push in terms of like diversifying newsrooms and making sure that there's more Muslims in the newsroom who can kind of contribute to more nuanced coverage. But sometimes the politics of representation can be really shallow. Is that person bringing a Muslim face or a Muslim voice? Are they actually helping shape coverage in an intelligent and nuanced way? Or are they just elevating themselves in their career? So it's, it's ripe for discussion and, and yeah, doing better. So one of the things that I find, and, and it, it, is, it speaks to your point, uh, Dr. Mohammed, and, and this maybe everyone can, can tap into it. Uh, journalism is probably one of the uh, few fields that is given so much power and scope with so little oversight, right? And that impacts everybody's daily lives. So if you think about whether any other industry, from medicine to schooling to whatever, there are, there's very clear oversights, standards and licenses and uh, 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 kind of professional trajectory to people's careers that are associated with 
um, uh, results-driven basis, right? Uh, so you're not going to walk into uh, surgery and say, well, you know, I read up a little bit about this. I'm pretty sure I can cut you up and sort it out, right? But as journalists, you can be sent to do an in-depth piece about the conflict in Somalia because you read some other journalists' three paragraphs about Somalia six weeks ago, and suddenly because you have that confidence on camera, oh, he's a Somalia expert, right? Um, and this, I think, speaks also to what Leila was saying, is that there is no best practice. There is no clear guidelines of it. And it's a very, very difficult balance to do because the moment you start going into it, people start talking about censorship and, oh my God, you're not letting me report in a certain way, which is in often there is a valid point to it in many cases. But on the other side, when it's left unchecked, you start having pieces like that New York Times article. Back in 2012, to support your point, actually, uh, Mohammed, I was in Cairo reporting, and Al Jazeera had, was about to launch Al Jazeera America. We had a team that came to the office uh, in Cairo, and they had just arrived, and the, uh, it was the reporter and a camera person, and the office is right next to a, a mosque, as is Cairo, this landscape, right? Call to prayer comes, Maghrib time. This is an Al Jazeera journalist, right, or Al Jazeera, for Al Jazeera America. Call to prayer starts, Allahu Akbar. The journalist, I've never seen anyone move so fast, took to the floor, like that, literally dived to the ground, to a point where I was confused about what, <laughs> you know. Um, and they generally thought, they heard the Allahu Akbar, and because they had been programmed to, you know, I, I don't know what they watched to prepare for their trip to come to Cairo, but it was, take to the ground, there's an, you know. Um, so, and, and why I say this is because, again, it made me really question, like, how we, like, first it was questioning, you know, how would these people hire this journal, journalist? But forget about Al Jazeera hiring them. How are, you know, this is somebody who's coming to report on, you know, and, and will be going to report on other things. So, when we talk about, you know, how the media constructs the narrative, it's all well and good to have these academic discussions and, and to do the research and to show it. But who's actually going to be policing these things in a certain way? Who's actually going to be changing it, doing those codes of best practice? Who's going to, who's going to force this? And I don't know, Spencer, if you want to... It's a great question, and I don't have a good answer for it, precisely because when you think about um, imposing a regulatory structure on media, the censorship question does become um, inevitable. Um, on the other hand, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm 43 years old. Um, I've worked uh, in journalism since, you know, I graduated, 2002, I guess. Um, and I've seen nothing but nonstop media failures that resulted in the deaths of millions of people. I don't really know how else I can put it that, that uh, created, you know, wealth extraction from however many um, tens of millions more, um, an apparatus of domestic repression that exists to this day that was greeted in um, news organizations with either, you know, anywhere on the spectrum from, you know, lack of scrutiny to outright support. Um, it's on the opposite side of that question is something I think that is nevertheless a virtue of, of media, which is that it's also, compared to a lot of other fields, relatively easy to get into. I don't have a degree um, in journalism, um, and somehow I've, I've managed to have a career. Um, I, what I would, however, do if, if I had a magic wand uh, would be to elevate people particularly um, into editorial positions, um, as well as working journalist positions, um, in inverse proportion uh, to family wealth. Precisely because very often you will see the people who uh, mess up the most and experience the least consequence um, and research the least and present themselves the most confidently do so because they've already been um, matriculated through a system in which there is uh, a lack of accountability for failure and forgiveness for when failure occurs, and overwhelmingly this happens uh, the wealthier someone is. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. yeah. yeah, please, man. So, yeah, good question. Um, first of all, I think, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't point out that there is good journalism out there. You know, even in American 
in the American tradition and in the, in the mainstream, we do find examples of good uh, journalism. So I Al don't. Al Jazeera, of course. <laughs> Actually, I think Al Jazeera does. I mean, I have my, you know, no, my, no, I have my complaints. I have my complaints, but uh, I think Al Jazeera does a does a nice job um, on a lot of these on a lot of these issues, um, especially comparatively speaking. But I think we, you know, there are some really good journalists out there. So we don't want to just. Um, sort of paint all of Western journalism with a broad brush because there are people who are really working hard to try to get the stories right, and there are really good examples of good stories that have, that have been done, even at the New York Times, which I'm, I'm and I'm very critical of, of the New York Times. Um, some, something that I tell my students a lot is we kind of expect too much from journalism. We expect journalism as an enterprise to educate us about like global affairs, and that's just too much to ask. Uh, journalism is an inherently imperfect enterprise. You're asking people to go out and get, you know, uh, information about events in in a, just a few hours, write it up in very brief form, and then and then publish it, you know, the next day or now with the internet the same the same day. I mean, it's we're expecting too much, and I think we've gone too far in that direction. Like we don't teach people to read anymore. Like people, we have to read books. We have to read research. And that brings me to the last thing that I want to say on this. I wish there was a greater connection between the journalism industry and the academy. Because, and this is something that I talk to my students about all the time, we, there's too much of a tension between academics on the one hand and then journalists on the other hand. Right, it, there, there's no synergy. In fact, there's almost like an uh, animosity. And when I've spoken with journalists about research, sometimes they're open-minded and, and they want to hear about the research, but other times they tell me like an editor once at a major uh, newspaper in the United States, he said to me, I don't want to hear about content analysis because, which is one of the main research methods that we, that we use. He said, I don't want to hear about content analysis because you guys just tend to find whatever you want to find. So he wasn't even interested in, in the research, in, in, in the literature. So I feel like one way to address some of these shortcomings would be to get journalists and scholars together for discussions and like, let's read one another. Let's learn, let's learn from one, one another. And I don't think that's happening to nearly the degree that it should. Well, we're doing it now. Uh, we are. Well, this is, of course, this is this is an exception to all the rules, as we've as we've Thank you, uh, Dr. Abdullah, and the Georgetown team for making it happen. Uh, I want to. Uh, there's a, one of the questions that we have here from uh, from the audience, um, and maybe Sana, you can you can start here. Um, could you discuss how systematic Islamophobia builds on other forms of systematic racism and violence against other minorities? Is it the same or different? And I know you spoke a bit about power and, and what the purpose serves. And yesterday we heard, uh, again, some of the elements of, of, of drawing on certain discriminations. And there are parallels and similarities and uniquenesses as well. That's a fantastic question because, um, you know, as, as I was also talking about, is that when we look at depictions of other th threat constructions within U.S. news media in particular, um, we then can really begin to understand um, what is the function of Islamophobia at a much more practical, economic, military, et cetera, level. Um, I think, like, I'll just, I'll give an example, right? Um, when we think about uh, Guantanamo, right? Uh, when we think about what it is, which is, you know, it's illegal under international law. It is literally a prison that it was create, which is created and holds uh, a very specific population, right? Which is Muslim men, right? It was 366 Muslim men and boys were held there for how, and are, are, many are still being held there to this day. Um, but we cannot also look at Guantanamo in and of itself. When we understand, for instance, American histories of incarceration and how incarceration, which also comes from the history of American enslavement, right? A lot of that begins to make sense, and especially how American incarceration has and continues to um, target a very specific demographic, which is black males and also Latino males, right? And how, but then we can also take that further. We look at, you know, the, when I talk to Guantanamo lawyers, lawyers who work for, uh, for, for those who've been uh, incarcerated at Guantanamo, uh, um, uh, 
one of them, um, she put it so extremely well, which was that for us to even understand the way that um, uh, what so-called migrant detention that takes place currently in the United States, where they, you know, anyone who's coming to the border, asylum seekers, refugees who are trying to escape the very conditions that were created by the government that they're now escaping to, um, uh, you know, that entire model is also based off of like the way Guantanamo itself was set up. And, right, and what was also Guantanamo? Before, you know, we had all these Muslim men and boys there. It was held as a detention center for um, deported Haitians right, in the early 90s, right? So all of these things, systems of violence and oppression and thus, like, you know, hatred, if you want to call it that, but it's so much more than hatred. Hatred is a feeling. It's, so, it's actually much more nefarious than, than hatred. All of them are connected, and, and, and that's the best way to understand these, that these aren't necessarily, uh, it's easy to look at things in a very individual way, but when you start making those connections, it makes it very clear, um, you know, that, that uh, uh, the power that these institutions, uh, and thus the narratives hold, right? So if you believe that, well, you know, and the vast majority of Americans do believe that the men who've been held in Guantanamo are rightfully held there. A lot of people don't know that, you know, at the core of why those men are also held there are, are false biographies that were written about these men, false charges. Or that most of them, or if not all of them, were, were held without charge, right? That's not something Americans know. You talk to most Americans, most, forget even Americans, you go outside the country. A lot of people be like, well, yeah, they were, they were like caught fighting. That's not quite the story, right? Um, but if you can justify that one thing, it's so easy to start justifying. Those migrants coming across the border, you know, it's, it, it continues. And, and I think we do a disservice as journalists to ourselves and especially to the public and especially to the victims of the systems of oppression and violence who we should be, right? As journalists, we're supposed to be punching up. But we're constantly punching down because we're not contextualizing how these systems are actually feeding off of one another um, and dehumanizing all people. Um, Spencer, if you want to touch on that as well, uh, the, the cross-section between the different discriminations. And sure, I think Sana makes some extremely valid and uh, prescient points. I would say as well that um, the war on terror didn't innovate anything. Uh, it, in terms of like narrow technological practices, sure. What it did was it opened a door to past patterns and practices in American settler colonialist history that took the form of uh, an horrific uh, slave trade uh, as a way of maximizing capitalist value off of labor and using human beings as capital, uh, which uh, was central to the economy of not just the American South, but uh, the financing in the American North. Um, genocide of the native peoples that lived in the United States, similarly for uh, economic value. Um, and with it as well comes uh, a pattern of justification that is both civic and religious in terms of instructing that uh, America's power stems from America's righteousness, which stems from America's blessings from God. Um, all of that serves a purpose of obscuring the violence that America practices systemically um, and looking at that violence that exists as uh, necessary to protect against security threats that America encounters, which have to be um, seen as uh, evil because of the righteousness that America inhabits. And we shouldn't be surprised uh, when we see these patterns in American history, both domestically and overseas, look a whole lot like each other. Um, the tools of the war on terror, uh, the, uh, port the Islamophobic portrayals that we see in it, are habituations from American history. Um, and it should be the job of journalists to point that out and challenge it. And instead, as Sana and everyone else points out, typically we punch down instead of looking at the real root cause. Uh, Leila? There's a question here that I'd like you to, uh, to speak to here. Uh, one of the audience is asking, if one of the solutions is to have better Muslim representation in media and in leadership positions, how can we address structural racism or structural Islamophobia that prevents this very outcome? So it's a bit of a catch-22 that you guys are proposing here, that you want more Muslim representation to stop the institutionalized Islamophobia that prevents more Muslim representation. 
It is a catch-22. I think, um, obviously, it's easy to feel helpless in this situation when it feels like it's, you know, circular, but um, I think it's as simple as, you know, encouraging more Muslims to pursue journalism. It's probably the hardest possible time to do it, but um, given the state of the industry, but I think um, not just pursuing journalism, but uh, on a more practical level, you have groups, you know, we talked about sort of the predominance of pro-Israel coverage and how that shows up as Islamophobic. On a practical level, there's groups like Camera, like Honest Reporting, sort of these advocacy groups that have a very real impact on newsrooms um, because they're so organized, they're so um, persistent. And I think similarly, if people want to push back on institutionalized racism, there needs to be counterbalances to these groups because they're very, very, very effective is what I hear from people in mainstream newsrooms. And even uh, Dr. Mosri mentioned there's some really great work being done in mainstream newsrooms, but when they hear from these groups, they're afraid and they end up um, maybe self-censoring or maybe thinking twice before they pursue th those kinds of stories. Um, so I think it, it's in addition to representation, there obviously needs to be other um, prongs of, of sort of fighting Islamophobia and that includes having similar advocacy groups that praise, you know, good journalism, that uh, try to throw their weight around in the same way that these groups do. And, you know, honest, so-called honest reporting, a very pro-Israel group, has actually very successfully um, had campaigns to uh, target Palestinian journalists specifically who work for foreign, or anybody who's expressed any sympathy for Palestinians. And what they do is they scour, they go through people's uh, social media posts, some from when they were young teenagers and may, may have said ill-advised things and news organizations and end up becoming very afraid and, and firing those people. So. You know, these are very real campaigns that pose a very real threat to any kind of change in the media. Can I, can I share something real quick? You can, I think Dr. Masri, okay, if you can go, go and then Dr. Masri, I was gonna ask you another question, you can tie it in after. I just also wanted to share that, you know, we talk about representation and whatnot, but it is also possible for you not to be, you know, a Muslim journalist and cover Muslim individuals and stories around and about Muslims and Islam in a really positive way. And I'm gonna give a really good example because this is one of my favorite things that I think at AJ Plus that we've produced ever in 2020, right? It is the dead of uh, COVID, terrible way to put it, but it was like, you know, in the dead center of COVID and it was a really devastating time, especially if you're in New York City, right? Like, you know, uh, there, were, there were literally freezers outside on the streets of, 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 of people who had, who had passed, passed away and AJ Plus did this fantastic piece, and there were, from what I recall, there were not Muslims involved in the, in the making of this piece, um, but it was about looking at following an imam in New York City who was doing something that a lot of people were terrified of doing, which is he was holding janazas or funerals for those who had passed from COVID. And, and, and it looked at just this, him, his family life, and just what it means to mourn in community in one of the most isolating times we've ever had. And I think it was a very human story that anyone could have connected to, and it is very possible to do these stories. We did it, right? And, uh, and everyone's like, oh, you're all to zero AJ+, plus. but it is very possible to do these stories. Um, and it's not just simply about representation, but about just getting to the heart of what is a universal story, mourning, funeral, community. Those are universal themes that we were able to do. So I just wanted to give a practical example. Thank you, thank you so much. Mohammed, I know you want to say something, and, and actually, uh, uh, I was going to ask something that uh, picks up on the COVID theme, actually, because I know you guys have been using the U.S. and U.S. media as a reference, but, um, you know, the British media is just as uh, significant often, um, particularly with the BBC, um, and obviously the history of, of, uh, uh, of its influence in this part of the world and, and, and internationally. So during COVID, uh, the BBC came under pressure, or at least under criticism rather, not under pressure, for the way in which it uh, reported on COVID uh, with regards to Muslims. It's not always through the context of the war and terror that Muslims are dehumanized or uh, the narrative is critical. What we found uh, at the time was that, for example, any image that was put together with a negative story on the BBC website about COVID, so whether it was COVID numbers, whether it was social mixing, whether it was people not wearing masks or whatever, for some reason, more often than not, there was a visibly Muslim person in that image, right? Uh, 
So I don't know if you ever, there was some research that was done on it, and I don't know, maybe there are some, uh, some people in the audience who would have uh, seen some of this stuff or, or not. But here, this was whilst, for example, you know, the first few doctors working for the NHS who lost their lives fighting COVID were Muslim, right? It was at the time where there was, uh, uh, you know, the Muslim community, Ramadan had come uh, uh, just a few months after COVID started and was, uh, you know, more scrutiny was put on it to see are people going to go and have communal iftars or not or, and so forth, whilst the Prime Minister was, you know, having a jolly in Downing Street and, and, and partying it up. So here is a question about the subtlety of, you know, when they were using those images, the, can, can, you know, how subtle can Islamophobia be? and dehumanizing. You guys were talking about that and whether it's intentional or not. And the question is, you know, why is it that those images were being used? Two, is there, is it just limited to the narratives of war and terror and other things? Because I know that the next panel is going to talk about football and the World Cup and so forth, but we saw also a lot of the dehumanization, whether it was the Moroccan team being uh, depicted as monkeys or, you know, with their, with their, with their mothers and what was happening in, uh, in European press. So if maybe you can touch upon that. Please. Yeah, I don't have, I mean, I don't have any information specifically or any data. I'm not aware of any research, but it's not, uh, what you just described isn't surprising given, given what we know. Um, and it's not just in, uh, you know, the negative portrayals, the negative sentiment is not just in coverage of terrorism or t coverage of crime. So in one of the really interesting studies that they did recently, a big data study where they looked at 850,000 newspaper articles published over uh, 17 years, uh, I'm sorry, over 20 years in 17 newspapers. Um, and they were comparing coverage of Muslims, Hindus, Catholics and Jews. And they find that across the board, the, uh, the sentiment of stories about Muslims is much more negative, whether it's about foreign news or domestic news, whether it's about terrorism and crime or not. So um, what you're describing is not, is not particularly surprising to me. Um, I wanted to say something uh, about Muslim representation. I think you know, we cannot highlight this enough. It's really important I mean, we sit here and we want to blame journalism or blame journalists, but it's really important for Muslims to actually help construct the narratives about themselves and about Islam. And right now, too often Muslims, especially Muslims in the West, are too passive and, and just sort of sitting back and not playing an active role. And if you look at a, a really great example is uh, Israel-Palestine, actually, because and I can tell you this as a, as a media scholar, but also as somebody who briefly worked in journalism for, for a couple of years when I was young. And I can tell you that the, the Israeli media relations uh, machinery is really on point uh, in the United States, the pro-Israel the pro uh, media machinery, right? So I'm not even talking about journalism or journalists. I'm just talking about from a media relations or public relations standpoint. Whereas the Palestinian media relations machinery is not, it's just not. So if you're a journalist working at a, a, a news organization and something happens in Gaza or the West Bank and you're furnished with a really nice media kit within, within hours, sometimes within minutes of the event happening and you have really eloquent spokespersons from the, from the pro-Israel side, you know, it really does, it can, it can tilt the balance of a, of a story quite significantly. And we've seen great examples of Muslims getting involved in journalism or media relations in the United States and in the West and making a significant uh, impact. And not just at places like Al Jazeera, but at mainstream outlets. Uh, Lama Al Aryan, uh, Laida's sister, has done great work and has impacted stories about Muslims, about Palestinians, um, about Arabs. Uh, Ayman Muhyiddin has also done some good work. Um, at MSNBC, who, and he's helped change uh, the narrative there. So when Muslims get involved, it does actually, uh, it does actually help. Spencer, do you have anything to tell? What? No? All right. Uh, yes, you can. No, I was just going to say about the COVID example mm -hmm. you brought up. A lot of times the coverage of Muslims tends to pathologize Muslim culture. So what's like a, nor like a human phenomenon suddenly becomes exotic and unique to Muslims. Mm -hmm. So we know, for example, that there was COVID denial in the US. You know, many white communities like 
were anti-maskers or um, you know, very much opposed to school closures, for example. But it was never pathologized as like, what is it about this community or their culture that's making them this way? Whereas you see that in the coverage of, of you know, Muslim societies and COVID. So just a small example. Um, there was a, a, sh a documentary on uh, PBS Frontline about, called Yemen's COVID cover-up. And it was about sort of COVID denial in Yemen. And within the first minute, they're talking about the Houthis. They're like, they're backed by Iran. And then you see a picture of an Israeli flag being burned. And you're just like, what does that have to do with Yemen's COVID cover-up, you know? So it's just the way that like images are suddenly inserted into these um, reports and, and including things that are not even relevant to sort of help shape that narrative and, and to make it feel exotic and violent. Uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes left. So what I want to do is maybe give each of you uh, a couple of minutes in terms of some closing remarks and thoughts if there are specific and I know we, we've spoken about uh, specific instances, certain data, practices that are there, the social conditioning that happens, and uh, whether it's kind of intentional uh, from one aspect or lazy journalism from another aspect. But maybe looking at like specific cha challenges or opportunities for being able to correct or redefine the narrative when it comes to uh, uh, the media and how it either deals specifically with Muslim-related issues and topics and stories, or whether it deals with or, or its duty to try and correct a narrative that will deal with Islamophobia and the rise of Islamophobia that the media itself has been responsible for, or many within the media uh, have been responsible for. So uh, whoever would like to start first, I'll leave this one as a... I'll, I'll start. Um, so uh, these discourses that we're talking about, uh, about Muslims in the, in the media, in American media, Western media, you mentioned British media. We don't want to neglect uh, British media. There's been a lot of really good research. Actually, Elizabeth Poole, um, uh, and there's another name that I'm missing. That they've done a lot of really good work on, on British media, and it's very similar to what we find in the, in the US, actually. Uh, but these discourses have been established very uh, hegemonically. They, these are hegemonic discourses now. And it's very difficult to push against the grain once, once they've become established. So there's a really a lot of hard work that has to be done by well-intentioned journalists and by Muslims and, and by activists to try to, um, to, try to reverse some, uh, some of this. There, and just to give you an, uh, some insight into how uh, you know, uh, daunting the challenge is, the, there was a, a really interesting study by a Duke scholar named Chris Bale uh, several years ago, where he looked at um, where he looked at these uh, fringe, these far right fringe groups that are run by people like uh, Daniel Pipes and uh, um, uh, Robert Emerson and Frank Gaffney in the United States, and they are very active in the media. They put out every single time there's an event or an incident, they put out press releases and statements, and they, they have press conferences and so on and so forth. So he looked at their statements, and on the other hand, he looked at the statements that are put out by Muslim civil rights groups like uh, CARE. So one of the interesting things that he found is that Muslim civil rights groups are denouncing terrorism until they're blue in the face. Like anybody who says that Muslims haven't denounced terrorism, and we can get into the discussion of should Muslims even denounce terrorism, and that's a, fair, that's a fair question, but there's no question that they have denounced terrorism, right? But what he found is that the, civil, the Muslim civil rights groups, their statements are not picked up by the mainstream media. And the statements that are put out by Frank Gaffney and Robert Emerson and Daniel Pipes and others who hate Muslims are picked up. And the numbers are, I don't have the numbers memorized, but the numbers are staggering. And he was doing a big data study using uh, computerized content analysis. And um, his book is called, I think it's called Terrified. Uh, it was published several years back. And you could read it if, if, if you'd like. It's quite fascinating. But this just gives you some insight into how, uh, how deep this, this challenge is. I'll just pick up on that a little bit and also um, something that Layla said. Um, newsrooms are also scenes of fear. Um, in the sense that uh, pressuring journalists overwhelmingly from the right, overwhelmingly from 
uh, the position of, of making them reinforce dominant narratives, criticizing them when they don't. Um, that works. That creates atmospheres of not just censorship, but especially self-censorship. Um, it operates on different levels, as, as Layla pointed out. Um, not just the way uh, stories are constructed, the way stories are edited, the way stories don't get assigned, the way language is used and not used within them. Um, <clears throat> while I don't formally endorse uh, pressuring journalists more, um, I think there is a thin-skinnedness about us as working journalists um, that lends itself to you know, the organizations that you pointed out, um, you know, working, that, that, you know, essentially those narratives and, and those pressure groups uh, prevail, and there isn't uh, a similar concern, this speaks to a lot of the structural things that, that everyone here is, has mentioned, uh, when organizations like CARE criticize the media, because I've, I've seen it in newsrooms myself. Um, those organizations are considered not respectable and are considered vaguely threatening. Um, Dr. Mosby mentioned um, the discrepancy in, in what's picked up and, and, and what's not picked up. I get CARES emails and, and I see those denunciations constantly. I'll just be frank with you. I'm a Jewish journalist and I'm, you know, very proudly so. No one has ever asked me, you know, put a camera in my face or, you know, anything else and said, you denounce Israeli apartheid. I've never faced that pressure. And you know, when, when you hear about and when you see uh, what uh, Muslim both journalists and uh, sources are constantly asked to denounce, you, you really see this, this, this discrepancy uh, tremendously. I would say that uh, putting uh, respectful but firm pressure on news organizations works and perhaps might be a, val a valuable way um, of confronting a lot of the structural power imbalances that we've been discussing. Go ahead, Sana. Um, yeah, it's probably better if I go before you because I don't I want to end on a bad note <laughs> or a negative note. Um, so I would consider, my, I, mean, I think I feel like for a lot of journalists, we're just, we may have big smiles, but we're hopeless pessimists sometimes. Um, I think that, you know, there, I, I, it's important to iterate um, there are incredible journalists out there who are doing incredible stories. I'm sitting with two of them right now, right? Both of the people I'm sitting here with are journalists that I look up to and have for years. So, and I'm really, you know, blessed to, to call them my friends. Um, but there's so many journalists who are doing, again, incredible work and they're pushing back in their newsrooms as well. Um, and so, in that regard, I'm very optimistic about what is possible at a much more individual level in terms of journalists who are out there. Because in general, and especially looking at the United States, um, and also a bit in the UK, um, obviously I've not worked in a UK newsroom, so I can't speak to that, but you know, we had a bit of a, a moments of reckoning, not, not the best, but in terms of issues of race and so on and so forth, where it's like, let's actually critically look at what's, what we're saying and how we're saying it in our newsroom. So I have a bit of optimism in, in, in that regard. But where I really kind of have this unfortunate sense of hopelessness, which is what comes with when you spend way too much time in like media uh, archives especially, is that so long as, and going back to what I was saying in terms of you know, what is the function of a bigotry, and in specifically what is the function of Islamophobia, um, so long as specifically US national security and foreign policy continues to function and look as it does, Right, and I was talking about that superstructure that exists, so long as that exists, the necessity of anti-Muslim politics within our news media and then those narratives will thrive. And sometimes it will be very nice, right? Because sometimes Islamophobia is actually very nice. Or I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even call it Islamophobia, but it is a function of it where you know, we see these nice stories about first woman in hijab to do this, which those are my least favorite stories because they, they still pathologize Muslim women. Right, and, and especially veiled Muslim women, um, visibly Muslim women as well, which is also a different function of, of this anti-Muslim politic um, that like, it's so unique that a Muslim woman is doing this because she wears a job. Um, so, you know, I unfortunately, yeah, I have a bit of a, a hopelessness there that so long as, you know, that the actual power, the military economic power requires the dehumanization uh, of over a billion people and then some, um, that these narratives cannot be undone in a 
substantive way. Um, I think they can be done, undone like you know, at a more localized level. I think we can see some fantastic, and we do see fantastic journalism coming out. And that's, I think, important to look out for and to spread in your networks and so on and so forth. If you're a professor, share those stories. Don't, don't share like, <laughs> the terrible things that come out of The Economist or the foreign policy. But, um, um, but yeah, so that's, that's where I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you. So much. Wisdom has already been shared, but just my final thoughts, you know, you don't have to be a journalist to have media literacy. So I think um, just approaching pieces that you see that, you know, appreciating and, and giving positive feedback to the good pieces, that's really critically important. And then being critical and vocally so of pieces that are problematic. So back in March, there was an article about the Lion's Den, which is a group of Palestinian, young Palestinian fighters in, in Nablus in the West Bank many of whom have been assassinated systematically by the state of Israel. And just looking at the article, and you see how many times have the word violence been used, maybe 10 to 12, and how many times is it used about Palestinians all, all of the times. So never was the word violence associated with Israel. Um, it used to be that social media gave readers and viewers and audiences access to kind of the journalist directly. Now, you know, specifically I think of Twitter, Elon Musk has kind of changed things around so that Journalists are less accessible, but hopefully there'll be more and newer tools to kind of make our voices heard, both as journalists, but also as audiences who've been empowered to kind of uh, reflect critically on some of the more problematic work that we've been discussing. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all the uh, panelists. Uh, for us to give you a quick round of applause.